All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Brendan Donahue with the Council of Juvenile Correctional Administrators, and uh, I want to introduce you to today's webinar, Trauma-Focused Screening and Assessment in Juvenile Justice Settings. I see a lot of people are still joining the webinar right now, and we've got over 400, almost 500 people registered for today's event. Uh, so before we get going and I hand things over to today's moderator, I just want to do a couple quick housekeeping uh, things and make sure that we all know how to operate today's webinar control. Uh, so you have the option to listen to today's webinar either on the telephone or through your computer speakers, but my big tip here is to make sure that you choose the correct option on your computer screen once you've joined. So if you're calling in on the telephone, make sure you choose the telephone option and then dial in. That'll really help disable any unwanted feedback or echo. If you're having anything like that, check those options on this screen. Now using the same control panel is how you can ask questions to our panelists here today. So if you have any questions that you want to ask, type them in at any point during the presentation. There's a chat window right on the panel itself, and if we can address it uh, as we go along, we will, and we will make sure that we have plenty of time for questions at the end of today's presentation. We are video recording today's presentation, so if you miss it, if you need to leave and come back, or if you ever want to refer somebody to this in the future, we'll make sure we send out a link with a video recording so that you can watch this again. And same thing with the slides. We'll make sure that we send out any materials, uh, the slides that we're using here today, and anything else that might be useful to you in follow-up emails, uh, which we're usually able to send out in about 24 to 48 hours after the webinar ends. So. Uh, be mindful of that. We'll make sure we send out copies of the presentation, ask questions to the panelists right here on the panel, and make sure you've got your audio settings set. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to today's moderator. It's Jennifer Jarowski, the Chief Mental Health Services, uh, Chief of Mental Health Services, I should say, in the Illinois Department of Juvenile Justice, and also the chair of CJCA's Mental Health Committee. So Jennifer, tell us a little bit about today's webinar. Okay. Thank you, Brennan. Hello, everybody. As Brendan said, I'm Jennifer Jaworski with the Illinois Department of Juvenile Justice and the chair of the Council of the CJCA Mental Health Workgroup. Today's presentation was planned by the CJCA Mental Health Workgroup. This group was formed over a year ago to help understand and improve mental health services in juvenile justice systems across the United States. CJCA realized that many of the mental health providers were struggling with the same issues, TRIA, screening and assessment, trauma-informed care, substance abuse issues, evidence-based practices, and lawsuits over lack of adequate mental health services, just to name a few. By forming an administrative group of providers who oversee mental health services in juvenile justice settings, we felt we could assist each other in addressing these issues. We thank CJCA and Ned Laugren for providing us the opportunity to meet monthly. We have spent much of the first year learning about the services each state provides in its facilities. We have come to realize not only our differences, but how much we share. Gaining knowledge of each state's juvenile justice operations has created a bond that allows many jurisdiction to jurisdiction conversations to occur. Members of our group support each other and a wealth of information has been made available. The CJCA Mental Health Work Group also wanted to focus on a project to enhance services at our site. We determined that trauma-informed care is an important issue and one we wanted more information on. Today's presentation is a result of those discussions. The CJCA Mental Health Work Group has worked on providing a total of four webinars that would enhance our knowledge of trauma-informed care. Madeline Byrne, Director of Treatment for the Texas Juvenile Justice Department, presented our first webinar and gave an overview of trauma-informed care in juvenile justice settings. Um, Today's webinar, oh wait, Brendan has told us how to access that webinar if you're interested. Today's webinar is presented by Dr. Patricia Keurig, a professor of psychology at the University of Utah. The subject for her webinar is trauma-focused screening and assessment in juvenile justice settings. I'm sure we will all benefit from this presentation. The following two webinars will also be quite exciting with some very knowledgeable presenters. They include Trauma Treatment by Julian Ford from the University of Connecticut and Implementing Trauma-Informed Care in Juvenile Facilities, Christopher Branson of the New York School of Medicine. We will keep you informed of the dates and times of these very informative webinars. We thank you for your participation today 
and hope you enjoy learning more from Madeline's presentation. Thank you uh, for Patricia, Patricia's presentation. Thank you, Patricia, for agreeing to share your knowledge of the subjects with us. With that, I will hand this webinar over to Dr. Carey. Thank you Mayor, very much, Jennifer, and uh, thank you to CJCA for inviting me to present this webinar today. I'm delighted <clears throat> to be with you here in uh, snowy Salt Lake City. Um, I do know that you had a prior webinar um, on trauma among youth in the juvenile justice system, and I don't want to repeat all of the information that you were presented, but to start us off with some context. I wanted uh, to know some Patricia, before we get going, I just want to see if I, we can get you to share the other side of the screen here. On the screen sharing, uh, you should be able to choose the other monitor. We're looking at the notes view right now. Did that fix the problem? There we go. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you for that. All right. Um, so I want to highlight some of the highlights of the research that tell us why it's so important to screen and assess for trauma in this setting. First, we know the majority of youth in the justice system have been exposed to some type of traumatic event with rates of trauma exposure ranging from 80 to 96 percent. Further, most of these youth have experienced multiple types of traumas. And many of these have been repeated experiences in a phenomenon that's termed polyvictimization. Common types of trauma exposure among youth in the juvenile justice uh, system include physical abuse and sexual abuse, witnessing violence in their homes and communities, and having lost loved ones under violent circumstances. Some youth involved in gangs have been forced to per uh, perpetrate on others in ways that haunt them. Others have been sexually assaulted or manipulated into participating in uh, sex trafficking. We know that these rates of trauma exposure among justice-involved youth are significantly higher than among youth in the community at large. For example, here is some data from a study conducted in Los Angeles by Jennifer Wood and her colleagues who compared youth in detention to demographically similar youth in the local high schools. As you can see in these graphs, the differences in prevalence rates of exposure to most forms of traumatic events um, were highly uh, significantly different. And here's some data from a recent study from my own lab group showing the percentage of detained youth in our study who acknowledged experiencing various kinds of traumatic events. Consistent with what other researchers find, the proportions are quite large. You can also see here some significant differences based on gender and gang involvement. For example, gang-involved youth reported much higher levels of community violence than other youth. And uh, gang-involved girls, who are represented here uh, by the red bars, reported significantly higher rates than other youth of exposure to physical abuse, sexual abuse, and emotional abuse. What isn't represented on this graph is that the average number of different kinds of traumas endorsed by these youth was more than six, and the majority of them reported repeated experiences of each of these kinds of traumatic events over different developmental periods. A second reason it's valuable to screen and assess for trauma is that childhood trauma exposure predicts adolescent entry into the justice system. And once youth are in the justice system, trauma predicts a number of significant behavioral and emotional health problems, including, but not only, post-traumatic stress disorder. But of course, PTSD is highly prevalent amongst youth exposed to trauma in the justice system with rates two to eight times higher than in the general population. Here again to illustrate this are some data from my own lab group showing that almost 30% of girls and 14% of boys reported symptoms of PTSD that were consistent with meeting full criteria for the diagnosis. These statistics are even more striking when, than when you consider that rates of PTSD among soldiers returning from Iraq 
range between 12 and 20 percent. A fourth reason why screening and assessment for trauma is important is that this has value in helping to align youth with the most appropriate interventions and services, directing scarce resources to those most in need, and increasing the physical and emotional safety of both youth and staff. Before we begin discussing the various tools that are available, it will be helpful to consider the distinction between screening and assessment. Screening refers to casting a wide net, often by universally screening all youth in a setting. To make this feasible, screening instruments are generally brief and simple to administer and don't require any formal clinical training. They also are highly flexible and can be implemented at many different points of system contact. The purpose of a screening instrument is generally to determine whether further assessment is needed. Assessment, in turn, is a more in-depth process that requires a trained mental health practitioner to conduct a more thorough and comprehensive evaluation. And thus, assessment is targeted toward those youth who have been determined to be in need. Although assessment is generally used to formulate an intervention plan, both screening and assessment have practical value in helping to guide trauma-informed and trauma responses, programming, and procedures in the juvenile justice system. But first, as you're thinking about designing a trauma screening protocol for your purposes, there are a number of questions I'd encourage you to ask. The first is, what is the goal you're trying to achieve through screening for trauma? And I have a pause. My computer is not responding. Maybe it just needs a minute. My apologies, everyone. Our, my computer has frozen. No. <clears throat> All right, Patricia. So I've I've actually got the slides up here that we can uh, try to follow along with. If you want to keep going, I'll show the slides to the the group here, and you can let me know if you get your computer back up and running. Uh, the problem is if I can't see the slides in my notes, um, it will be challenging for me to present them. Hmm. Well, it is well and truly stuck. You log out and read. Ah, I think I am back up and running. All right. Uh, okay, let's start again. So the first question that I would encourage you to ask is, what is the goal um, of your screening? Yeah, For Patricia, example, if you back up on your screen. Yeah. Go ahead and do the show show screen again so that we can see where you're at. All right, is that showing? There we go. We're back up and running. Sorry for that. Okay. Sorry for the technical difficulties, everyone. So there are a number of different goals that you might have for conducting a trauma screening. For example, are you trying to document a youth's trauma history? Are you trying to identify youth who are in need of trauma-specific services? 
Or are you hoping screening will help you identify those youth who might have adverse reactions to justice system processes because of the possibility they'll experience them as re-traumatizing? Or is your goal to identify youth who might be at risk of harm to themselves and others and to inform a safety plan for them while they're in care? These are all different goals and they may be better met by some instruments than by others. I also wanted to note that there's a separate literature on tools that have been validated for determining the risk of violence and recidivism. And that won't be our focus here, but I've provided you on the screen a resource that you might find uh, to be valuable. So what if your goal is to determine whether a youth has been exposed to a traumatic event? As the data we just looked at show in juvenile justice settings, it's almost certain that the answer will be yes. But a caveat to keep in mind here is that not all youth exposed to potentially traumatic events are traumatized by them. Some have protective factors that allow them to be resilient even in the face of trauma exposure. Having said that though, it's important to note that many of the studies investigating resilience after trauma have focused on what Lenore Terror referred to as type one traumas, the short, sharp shock of a single traumatic incident, such as an accident or a natural disaster. In contrast, many youth in justice settings have experienced what are called type two traumas, the chronic, repeated kinds of interpersonal insults that often are pervasive in a child's home life throughout their early years, such as abuse or domestic violence, when harm is perpetrated by those who should be protecting a child and providing care. In addition, there are developmental differences in what individuals perceive as traumatic and a child by view differs from that of an adult, especially when it comes to experiences such as loss or separation from a caregiver. And trauma screens vary in the extent to which they assess these kinds of experiences. A second goal of trauma screening might be to determine whether a youth likely meets criteria for a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. As of this year, we have a new diagnostic manual, the DSM-5, and a new list of criteria for the PTSD diagnosis. And I'll talk a little later in this webinar about the changes from the DSM-4 to the DSM-5 criteria. But what I wanted to point out here is that there are now four clusters of symptoms, all of which must be present to an extent that they cause distress or interfere with the youth's functioning. These include intrusions of past traumatic events into present experience, avoidance of trauma reminders, changes in emotions or cognitions, including emotional numbing or negative beliefs about the self, the future, and the world, and hyperarousal, which now includes, in addition to the classic symptoms of hypervigilance, which is jumpiness and looking over one's shoulder, new symptoms of irritability and self-destructive behavior. A caveat here is that these are quite various symptoms. Being emotionally numb is very different from being hyper-aroused. So it's probably not surprising that children and adolescents often display symptoms in some domains, but not others. Therefore, youth may not qualify for a diagnosis of PTSD and yet have symptoms severe enough to significantly interfere with their functioning. In addition, there are controversies in the field that have led to differences among the new diagnostic systems. For example, the new ICD system is the main alternative to the DSM-5, which is used in Europe and increasingly is being used by insurance companies in the US. In its recent revision, it differs from the DSM-5 in that it recognizes a separate syndrome called complex trauma which emerges in the aftermath of exposure to those type two repeated chronic interpersonal traumas such as child abuse. 
the DSM-5 developers rejected the proposal to include co uh, complex trauma in DSM-5 and also rejected a proposal to create a developmental trauma disorder diagnosis, especially for children. So a third goal of screening for trauma might be to establish not the presence of all criteria for the diagnosis, but rather whether this youth is experiencing post-traumatic stress reactions that are currently affecting his or her functioning. In this regard, it's helpful to consider the fact that among all the symptoms of PTSD, the one that seems most unique to post-traumatic reactions is intrusion, what an old DSM was termed re-experiencing. <clears throat> youth who have unwanted images of traumatic events that intrude on their thoughts during the day, who find themselves reliving those moments, or who have nightmares, these youth are showing signs more suggestive of PTSD than of other disorders that have overlapping symptoms with PTSD. In addition, some research suggests that the symptoms of emotional numbing, having difficulty accessing emotions, giving no pleasure in life, no longer caring about things they used to care about, feeling a sense of futurelessness, these are particularly likely to arise in the context of type 2 chronic repeated interpersonal stressors, such as those that youth in the justice system often report experiencing. Numbing also is of particular interest given that some theories suggest post-traumatic numbing may be implicated in the development of the kinds of behavior problems that lead to juvenile justice involvement. But overall, the state of the science to date suggests that traumatized youth in the justice system will show diverse kinds of symptoms, and therefore it's best to cast a wide net when screening for trauma. <clears throat> so depending on the purpose of your assessment and the resources in your agency and community, you might want to keep in mind that screenings for trauma exposure likely will identify most youth in the justice system. About one half of girls and a third of boys will show post-traumatic symptoms, and a far fewer number will meet full criteria for a formal diagnosis of PTSD. So part of your decision-making about what to target in screening will involve your resources and whether you are able to follow up with more in-depth mental health assessments or trauma-informed services for 96% or 30% or 15% of the youth in your caseloads or facilities. So to encapsulate this, trauma screening will involve the use of different tools for different purposes, and each kind of tool has its strengths and limitations. For example, any trauma events screener will be limited to the specific events it inquires about and the language that it uses to label those events. For example, studies show that many young women do not use the term rape for unwanted sexual experiences, especially when those were drug or alcohol facilitated or perpetrated by romantic partners or family members. Similarly, youth who have undergone chronic sexual, physical, or psychological maltreatment at the hands of their caregivers may not label those experiences as abuse. In turn, as we've discussed, screeners for the PTSD diagnosis may overlook those youth who are distressed but don't meet full criteria for the diagnosis. But perhaps most importantly, past traumatic events comprise static risk factors that can't be changed, whereas current post-traumatic symptoms are dynamic factors that are amenable to intervention. So those caveats notwithstanding, there may be very good reasons for systems to want to document a youth's history of exposure to traumatic events. For example, there may be special programming available for youth who've experienced specific kinds of traumas, such as sexual assault, traumatic loss, or commercial sexual exploitation. Knowing a youth's history also can help systems to anticipate experiences that might trigger 
a post-traumatic reaction. So let's look at some screeners designed to assess for trauma history and exposure. Here are some of the most widely used and well-respected measures of trauma history that might serve your purposes, and I've included the website or email address where you can obtain them. For example, if you serve a large number of crossover youth, those who are involved in both child welfare and juvenile justice, you may want to have detailed information about the kinds of maltreatment they've experienced, and therefore a measure such as the TESI or the CTQ might be most useful. Or you may have need for a comprehensive measure of all forms of victimization the youth has experienced, including at the hands of peers and community members, which would be provided by the Juvenile Victimization Questionnaire. On the other end of the spectrum, a very brief 10-item measure, such as the ACEs, might be most useful when you have the opportunity to gain information from youth in only a very short window of time. The ACEs includes not only in events that meet the formal definition of trauma, such as physical abuse, but also other forms of adversity that have negative effects on child development, such as having grown up with a family member who was depressed or used drugs. Another comprehensive trauma history measure is the trauma history profile that was developed at UCLA by Robert Pinus and Ellen Steinberg. This is not a self-report, but a rating form that's completed by a clinician after obtaining as much information as possible from as wide a variety of sources as possible, including the youth, caregivers, and case records. In addition to the kinds of events on most trauma history measures, such as maltreatment and exposure to violence. This measure is like the ACEs in that it widens the net to consider other adverse experiences that children and youth report feeling to be traumatic, even if they don't meet the official DSM criteria. These include living with an impaired caregiver and losing loved ones due to bereavement or traumatic separations. In addition, this measure inquires about the ages at which traumatic events occurred so as to provide a developmental profile of trauma exposure. And here is an image of one of the pages from the uh, trauma history profile to show you how the questions are laid out. And here's an example of how the trauma history profile was used to describe the youth in a large database from the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, giving a clear display of how the experiences of different forms of trauma exposure changed over the course of development from ages 0 to 5 to 6 to 12 and then into the adolescent years. A limitation of most comprehensive trauma history tools is that they are long and most require a trained and clinically sensitive interviewer. So in contrast, there's a very brief self-report screening tool available as part of the MAISI-2, the Massachusetts Youth Screening Instrument. The MAISI is the most widely used mental health screening measure in detention settings across the U.S. The MAISI was developed by Thomas Grisso and his team at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. Uh, it's normed for youth ages 12 to 17 and includes 52 yes-no questions regarding the youth state of mind in the most recent few months. The questions form seven scales, which assess a wide variety of mental health concerns, including substance use, anger, depression, somatic complaints, suicidal ideation, and for boys, thought disturbance. And in addition, there's a scale labeled traumatic experiences. The MAISI was developed with two purposes in mind. The first is what the developers call an alerting function, and that's to help staff identify youth entering a facility or program who are at possible risk of harm to themselves or others and thus need to have precautions implemented um, for safety. 
The second purpose is to identify youth who benefit from a more exhaustive mental health assessment. The MAISI has a number of significant strengths. It screens for a wide range of mental health problems. There are national norms available based on large samples drawn from different geographic regions. And separate norms are available for different genders and ethnic groups. Um, it's also available in both English and Spanish language versions. Um, it's easy to administer, requiring no um, mental health expertise or advanced training for detention staff. And in general, the scales have good uh, reliability and validity. It's also youth-friendly, especially if the Maisyware software is used to administer it in a computer-assisted format where the youth hears the questions over a headset and then answers privately on a computer screen. Um, with this administration, no literacy is required, which um, is very helpful for justice-involved pop uh, populations. And with the computer administration, the measure takes only about 10 to 15 minutes to administer, and it's quickly scored by the computer, which then generates a report indicating which scales are at the warning or caution level. There are some considerations and cautions that should be made, however. One is that to ensure valid scoring, it's ideal for staff to follow up when youth have endorsed key items with a set of secondary screening questions that are administered uh, by interview. The secondary screening questions allow staff to make sure that youth's responses indicate what they really meant to say and aren't simply a matter of misunderstanding the question or describing feelings the youth had in the past but doesn't in the present. And they also allow staff to gauge how serious and immediate any concerns might be. So the secondary screening questions are highly valuable, but they do change the context of the administration. Youth who are being interviewed are aware that their responses are no longer private, and this could affect their willingness to admit to certain symptoms, especially those involving illegal activities such as substance use or those they know might get them put on precautions, such as acknowledging uh, thoughts about self-harm. Pardon me. And in justice context, there may be no guarantee of confidentiality or that their responses won't be communicated to authorities or affect their uh, court proceedings. Another caution is that the MAISI is only intended for assessing the youth's mental state at the time of entry into a facility or program. It's not intended nor validated for predicting longer-term functioning or future behavior. And finally, none of the scales are intended to map onto diagnostic criteria for any specific disorder, nor to establish in and of themselves the need for treatment um, for any disorder. But given that our focus here is on screening for trauma, let's take a closer look at the MAISI-2 Traumatic Experiences Scale. It stands apart from all the other MAISI scales in a number of respects. First, it's the only subscale that didn't go, undergo empirical validation by being compared with other established measures of the same construct. Second, it's the only subscale with no cutoff scores established to indicate when a score should be considered a red flag. And third, it's the only subscale with no secondary screening questions to help determine the validity of a youth's responses. The scale was developed through factor analysis of a large number of items that were reduced down to the ones that correlated best with one another. The resulting scale includes five items in total, four items that are identical for boys and girls, and one item that's unique to each gender. The items common to both genders include three questions regarding exposure to traumatic experiences, such as, have you ever had something very bad or terrifying happen to you? A fourth item reflecting trauma exposure appears only on the scale for girls, and that is, have you ever been raped or been in danger of getting raped. 
And a fourth item that seems to reflect paranoia appears only on the scale for boys, and that is have people talked about you a lot when you're not there. And this is not unusual when scales are derived through factor analysis uh, in that they end up with some items loading on them for reasons that aren't intuitively obvious. And finally, one question was uh, included that reflects the post-traumatic symptom of re-experiencing. That is, have you had a lot of bad thoughts or dreams about a bad or scary experience? So although the label of the scale is traumatic experiences, it actually is a combination of experiences and symptoms. Because the Maisie TE scale hadn't been validated previously, our lab decided to take an initial stab at doing that. The findings I'm going to be presenting here are based on a sample of almost 500 adolescents remanded to a county juvenile detention center in Ohio. Upon intake to the detention center, youth completed the computer-administered Maisie 2 and a well-validated measure of PTSD, which I'll be describing in detail later in this presentation. And we also asked youth to complete a measure of complex PTSD symptoms, such as guilt, dissociation, and impaired relationships, which are uh, most likely to incur following repeated exposure to interpersonal trauma. I'm going to just quickly display some of the results, uh, although I recognize not everyone in the audience is the kind of data geek that I am. But the take home point that I want to share is that the Macy TE scale was only modestly correlated with PTSD symptoms for boys or girls. And in fact, other Macy scales, such as anger and depression, were even more highly correlated with PTSD symptoms. Lastly, the Maisie TE scale was only modestly correlated with complex PTSD symptoms for boys and not at all for girls. The next question we tackled is whether the TE scale was accurate in identifying those youth who scored positive for the presence of the PTSD diagnosis. To answer this question, we used a technique called the area under the curve to determine how well the Maisie detected those youth in that criteria for a diagnosis of PTSD. Essentially, what we want to see on these graphs is a blue line that arcs away from that green straight line as far as possible. We want a large area under the curve. Overall, what we found is that the area under the curve statistic for the TE scale was just into the moderately accurate range for both boys and girls. But again, when we compared the accuracy of the TE scale to the other two scales that were predictive of PTSD, angry, irritable, and depression, anxiety, these detected PTSD equally as well as the TE scale. Lastly, we looked at how various cutoff scores provide the uh, two key measures of a screener's utility. The first of these is sensitivity. That is, the power to identify those youth who are true positive, who do meet criteria for PTSD. The second index is specificity. And that's the power to correctly identify those youth who don't meet criteria for the diagnosis, the so-called true negatives. And here's where an agency's decision rules need to kick in, depending on the relative balance of resources and need. For example, a cutoff score of two on the TE scale would capture a lot of youth in our net who need trauma-specific services with 80% true positives. But it also would capture a lot who may not with 50% false positive. In turn, a more stringent cutoff of three would correctly identify 62% of youth, but would miss 38% of those who might benefit from interventions for PTSD. But on the other hand, a cutoff score of three would reduce the false positive rate to 25%. 
to quickly summarize across the other analyses we ran, the MAZI TE scale did contribute to the prediction of PTSD symptom levels, but only in combination with other symptoms that likely accompany PTSD in youth. Specifically, these were anger and depression for boys, and anger, depression, and somatic complaints for girls. The TE scale did not predict complex PTSD, and there are a number of possible explanations for this, um, including some of the um, issues we talked about earlier regarding um, the uh, assessment of um, repeated uh, complex trauma experiences not being well captured by the measure, and also perhaps problems with the terminology used, such as the labeling of unwanted sexual experiences with the term rape. So this, in summary, these data suggest that the MAZI-2 traumatic experiences scale can be a valuable tool for helping to identify traumatized youth but it probably should be used in conjunction with some of the other tools in our toolbox, especially for those youth with complex trauma histories. Uh, and here is information regarding uh, how to obtain the MAZI-2 or uh, to find out more information regarding it. So I'd mentioned uh, the need for other tools in our toolbox, and let's talk about um, some of those. The next measure I want to describe is the UCLA Post-Traumatic Disorder Reaction Index, or the PTSD-RI. For many years, this has been the most widely used screening tool for PTSD in children and adolescents. And recently, it's been updated for DSM-5. It's designed for youth um, between the ages of 6 to 18. And there are both youth and caregiver reports, as well as both English and Spanish language versions. Although it doesn't establish a diagnosis, it provides information about the likelihood that youth meet the DSM-5 criteria for PTSD. And just to provide the briefest of thumbnail sketches about how these criteria have changed from DSM-4, there are three essentials in regard to um, the diagnosis of PTSD in adolescents. First, the definition of what comprises a traumatic event has been restricted in some ways, including that exposure to death is only considered to meet the criteria for trauma if the death was accidental, violent, or unexpected. And I don't want to digress uh, too far at this stage, but we can certainly talk more about this as people are interested in the uh, discussion time. But um, it's important to note that this is inconsistent with the developmental research that shows children are actually more likely to de demonstrate symptoms of PTSD when they're exposed to expected death, and this may be because the long, slow decline of a terminally ill or aged uh, family member exposes children to a long process of grief and distress um, among people in their family and possibly even exposure um, to gruesome medical details. But this is the way that trauma exposure has been redefined in the DSM-5. Another change is that there's no longer a requirement that the event must have been accompanied by the subjective reactions of fear, helplessness, or horror. And a third important change is that there is now a dissociative subtype that is recognized in the PTSD diagnosis. So how does the PTSDRI go about um, screening for trauma? All told, the PTSDRI includes 46 questions and takes about uh, 10 to 15 minutes to complete. First, the PTSDRI asks questions to establish the presence of uh, trauma exposure by inquiring as to the whether, whether the youth has experienced 
any of 14 different kinds of potentially traumatic experiences. And here you can see the range of experiences included to which the youth responds um, either yes or no. If youth do endorse any of the traumatic events, they're then asked to identify the one event that they consider to be the worst and to rate the extent to which in the past month they've experienced any of a list of 32 symptoms of PTSD. These symptoms involve the four DSM-5 clusters of intrusions, avoidance, changes in cognitions and mood, and hyperarousal, as well as dissociation. And here's an image of one page so you can see the format of those questions uh, with some blocked out so that I don't violate the developer's copyright um, by displaying them in the PowerPoint. To help youth better grasp the frequency ratings over the past month, these graphic representations of calendars are provided showing what a response of never versus almost every day would look like. There are several different scores that can be derived from the PTSDRI, including whether or not PTSD criteria likely have been met, uh, a continuous rating of the overall severity of PTSD symptoms, and then severity symptom scores for each cluster separately. And here you can see the PTSDRI scoring sheet, which walks you through the process of deriving each of those scores. There are a number of strengths to the PTSDRI. It is well validated, it's easy to administer, it's available in multiple languages, it provides both categorical and continuous scores, and it's available for a low cost. Some limitations include that at 42 questions in total, it may be long for some juvenile justice processes and circumstances. In addition, the scoring does require some training, although it's not difficult to learn. And further, because it's a screening instrument, it doesn't provide a diagnosis, but only indicates whether a diagnosis is likely. And finally, uh, the PTSDRI is restricted to screening for PTSD and doesn't tap related symptoms that might be affecting a youth functioning. So if used as part of an assessment, it's best used in combination with other measures. And here is information about how to um, obtain the PTSDRI or to learn more about the measure. There is a new alternative that's recently been uh, developed that I wanted to introduce you to, and it also wins today's webinar's prize for the most clever title. This is the Structured Trauma-Related Experience and Symptom Screener, or the STRESS, which was developed by Damien Grasso at the University of Connecticut. In addition to a paper and pencil version, the STRESS also has a computer administered and scored option that is very user friendly. It's appropriate for children or adolescents and takes about 10 to 15 minutes to complete. It includes 25 questions designed to assess exposure to various kinds of potentially traumatic events and 21 items that assess symptoms, including the four DSM-5 symptom clusters, the presence of dissociation, and the degree to which symptoms are interfering with functioning. And in the 2015 article that's cited here on the screen, you'll find empirical data confirming the factor structure, feasibility, and internal consistency um, of the measure. Uh, the stress differs from the PTSDRI in a number of ways. It assesses an even wider array of both traumatic and adverse events that youth may have experienced, and in addition uh, includes the age range at which those events occurred. 
It also includes an index of functional impairment, and it asks about symptoms in a shorter time frame. Um, youth are asked to report whether they have experienced the symptoms within the past week rather than the past month, which may be more appropriate for children. It doesn't require the youth to pick the one worst event when reporting symptoms. And this is consistent with research um, suggesting that having to choose one event to report on can lead to the underreporting of uh, symptoms. And the computer administration of the stress fits with research showing that young people often will disclose more to a computer than to an interviewer. And of course, having the computer score the measure uh, maximizes how user-friendly it is for justice staff. Dr. Grasso was gracious enough to create a video demonstrating the stress in action, uh, which is posted to YouTube, and I provide here the link for those who'd like to uh, see it in action. And if it turns out that we have time at the end of the webinar and there's interest, uh, I'd be happy to see if we can uh, view it together. Here's an example of the kind of report that is generated by the computer-administrated version of the stress. You can see here it provides detailed informa information regarding the specific events that were endorsed by the youth, as well as the symptoms that the youth endorsed. The report also indicates how to interpret the results, including whether they indicate no concern, concern at the caution level, or more significant concerns at the warning level. And to obtain the stress or more information about it, here is Dr. Grasso's contact information. Now, before we go on to talk about some other screening tools, I want to take us back to the list of questions designed to guide your development of a trauma screening protocol in your setting. We've already talked about the first one is choosing a screening protocol that best meets your goals and purposes, but there are a few additional considerations regarding uh, implementation. For example, the second question to consider is your system's readiness to implement trauma screening. Once you've obtained a tool, are there staff available and trained not only to administer it, but to respond effectively and sensitively to any youth who might choose to disclose traumatic experiences or who might feel distressed in the aftermath of completing such a measure? And is training and ongoing consultation available to protect staff who are exposed to youth reports of trauma from the negative effects of such exposure, which can include secondary traumatic stress or vicarious trauma. This is a very important consideration that comprises a workshop all in itself, um, and I also can talk more about this in the question and answer period um, if there's interest. A third consideration is once you've obtained this information from youth, what will you do with it? This leads to questions related to a system's readiness to follow through after screening. For example, are there evidence-based, affordable, and accessible trauma-informed services available in your community to which you can refer youth and families to obtain a follow-up assessment or trauma-specific treatments if those are deemed appropriate? And how might system practices be informed and adapted in the light of this information? For example, are there trauma-informed procedures that staff are prepared to implement in detention, residential, probation, or court settings when a youth has demonstrated that she or he would benefit from such approaches? A fourth important consideration concerns youth's rights to privacy, protection from self-incrimination, and psychological safety regarded to the, re, related to the disclosure of the kinds of sensitive information that might be asked by a trauma screener. 
For example, it's important to consider how the context in which screening is conducted could impact a youth's willingness to acknowledge trauma-related information and thus the validity of their responses and whether non-endorsement represents a true negative. At many points in their contact with the justice system, traumatized youth may be feeling distrustful and unwilling to reveal personal information about the experiences they've undergone. And that may be for good reason, as we discussed regarding the NAZI-2 uh, secondary screening questions, confidentially, confidentiality pardon me, is not necessarily guaranteed when youth complete measures in forensic settings. For example, we find in our studies that many youth with trauma histories are re-victimized in the context of engaging in activities that could get them into further legal trouble. The examples <clears throat> range widely that include um, violent encounters youth have while they're violating curfew or participating in gang activities. Um, often alcohol and illegal substances are involved. So these youth may have additional reasons to not disclose information when screening is conducted in justice-related settings. Even if legal jeopardy is not involved, psychological safety is an important consideration as well. For example, a boy entering a locked facility might not feel psychologically safe revealing to male staff that he's been the victim of sexual abuse at the hands of another man. All in all, it's essential that youth and families be informed at the outset about what the purpose is of the screening, whether or not the youth has the right to decline to answer questions, and who will have access to the information they provide. Two different mandates come into play here. One concerns state laws regarding mandated reporting, which may require staff to report certain kinds of traumatic experiences, such as child abuse. And the other concerns local laws regarding whether screening information may or may not be kept confidential, and whether it may or may not be allowed to enter into judicial decision making. Because these vary significantly from state to state, it's important to be familiar with the laws in your own jurisdiction so as to be able to give youth and families accurate information regarding their rights and the way trauma screening information might be used in the legal process. There are some excellent resources available to guide us here. One is a document from the Juvenile Law Center regarding protecting youth from self-incrimination during screening, assessment, and intervention. And the second is a compendium of state laws that was compiled by the National Juvenile Def Defender Center that will allow each agency to have accurate information regarding what use can be made of any disclosures youth make as part of trauma screening or assessment. For example, when I use this reference to inform myself about the statutes governing self-incrimination in my own home state, I found the results to be illuminating and far from the blanket reassurance that I was expecting to find. So with these considerations in mind, I want next to introduce you to some new tools that were designed specifically to be non-intrusive and to be useful in contexts in which confidentiality might be of paramount concern. So the tools I'm going to introduce you to now specifically focus not on past traumatic events, but on current post-traumatic reactions. The first is a very brief screener that was developed by the AMBIT network <clears throat> at the University of Minnesota. And I put in the header here the website address where you can download the measure free of charge. It's appropriate for preschoolers through adolescents, and it asks only one question regarding exposure to traumatic events and four questions about post-traumatic symptoms. Some validation uh, data are available um, to date that indicate um, good sensitivity and specificity. And here is a screenshot of the measure 
And you can see how very simple and child-friendly it is. The youth is asked to report about um, bad or upsetting events that he or she might have experienced. But the beauty of the measure is that the youth is free to say as little or as much as he or she chooses. The second very brief screener I want to introduce you to is one that I developed uh, specifically with justice-involved adolescents in mind. Like the stress, it can be administered in a paper and pencil version with a simple scoring rubric provided, or we've developed a computer resident administration and scoring program that provides a voiceover administration of the items to the youth, automatically scores them, and then produces a report regarding the results. It was designed to be a very brief screener with only 15 questions. There's one non-intrusive trauma exposure question designed to determine if a traumatic event has ever been experienced, but not to inquire about the details of it. 13 questions related to post-traumatic symptoms in the past month that aren't tied to any one specific event and one question designed to ascertain whether the trauma exposure is not just in the past, but is ongoing by asking the youth about current concerns she or he may have about safety. An important caveat about this measure is that it's currently in the validation stage, and so it is best used uh, descriptively. Here is an image of the paper and pencil version of the measure. And here is an image of the kind of report that's generated by the computer administered and scored version. It indicates whether the youth score overall is in the uh, clinical range, and if so, which symptoms were endorsed and whether the immediate safety item is a red flag. Uh, to obtain the Utah Traumatic Experiencing Scale or more information about it, um, here is my contact information. Now, what I want to turn to now is a discussion about how you might use this kind of information to put a trauma-informed justice system into action. So let's say you've completed a trauma screening. What will you do with this information? How can your work with youth in justice settings be trauma-informed in ways that are useful to you? Let's start by talking about the post-traumatic symptom of intrusion to re-experiencing which I'd mentioned before as being the most unique to PTSD versus the other mental health problems that are commonly seen among justice-involved youth. Re-experiencing doesn't just mean remembering what happened. During episodes of re-experiencing, youth are right there in that moment, as though the event is happening again right here and right now. Think of the state of mind you were in last time you were in a situation of life threat. When your tire burst on the freeway and you had to quickly cross over three lanes of heavy traffic. When you got the call that your child had just been rushed to the hospital. When the smoke alarm went off in the middle of the night and you were half asleep. Then imagine somebody coming up to you at that moment and asking you why your paperwork is late. That's the state of mind that traumatized youth are in much of the time. Their internal alarm is easily triggered by subtle reminders that put them back in the moment of trauma, and they interpret what's going on around them from a frame of mind of intense threat. Youth have been traumatized, therefore, are highly likely to misinterpret others' behavior as threatening and to go quickly into extreme fight-or-flight reaction mode. It's as though you're trying to have a conversation with the youth about why he wasn't paying attention in class today while a fire alarm is blasting in his ear. 
the executive functions of the brain that contribute to our ability to think through problems and come up with thoughtful solutions are basically taken offline and the uterus is responding purely on the basis of the kinds of primary motions that help us to respond immediately when we're in a situation of life threat. This is one of the reasons why knowing about trauma is so important. Sometimes these youth are misdiagnosed as ADHD, for example, or bipolar disorder, and the treatments they're offered simply do not hit the mark. For example, one girl who was the survivor of multiple sexual assaults had explosive episodes that made no sense to anyone around her. She was misdiagnosed with schizophrenia and given antipsychotics that did nothing to heal her trauma. Another youth who had seen his father shot by the police was triggered at school by the school safety officer's uh, gun at his side and got into an altercation with him. This youth ended up with a broken arm after being taken down and faced serious legal charges. Many of these will be the youth you'll see who have bombed out of multiple placements and treatments. Trauma is also one of the things that makes these youth so challenging to work with. These are the toughest kids in your facilities and on your caseload, the ones who are most likely to get into fights, to recidivate, to harm themselves, to get killed once they're released, the ones who are most likely to fail every intervention you and others put in their path. It's frustrating to invest in a youth only to see them fail. So working with these youth also may contribute to the burnout and staff turnover we see in juvenile justice facilities, as well as vicarious trauma from what these youth disclose and display. Frontline staff need to deal with a lot of traumatic material as they work with these youth and need um, support to enable them to do that effectively. So what a trauma-informed screening protocol can offer you is a more effective way of doing your job, and that is by helping you and the youth to understand what triggers them as well as what helps them to cope with those triggers and regain personal control. So let's look at a couple of tools designed to help you to do just that. The tool I'm about to show you represents a fourth type of trauma screening, not focusing on trauma exposure, post-traumatic stress symptoms, or PTSD diagnosis, but rather focusing on identifying what are likely triggers for post-traumatic reactions, what are the signs youth have been triggered? And what are the strategies they can use to keep themselves and others safe? And as I'll uh, discuss more, this is a most effective strategy when it's used as part of an ongoing process involving staff learning these things about a youth and the youth learning them about themselves. Now, there are a number of different versions of similar tools available, um, and I wanted to acknowledge that the one I'm going to show you was inspired by one originally developed by the Massachusetts Department of Mental Health in the uh, early 2000s. When we originally developed this tool, we had separate versions for younger children and adolescents with uh, text for the older youth and pictures for the younger ones. But when I introduced this to a training of probation officers, they asked if they could use the pictorial version for the adolescents in their caseloads because so many of them find reading challenging or don't have English as a first language. So, uh, and also because it's cute, um, I will show you that version uh, first for your consideration. The first page of this tool invites you to identify the situations that trigger them or push their buttons. And these can be quite various. For example, for some youth, feeling crowded with too many people around is triggering. Whereas for other youth, the post-traumatic trigger might involve feeling abandoned and left alone. The second page lets youth clue staff into the signs and signals that they have been triggered. And again, these will vary widely. For some youth, the key sign of distress 
is overt anger and a raised voice volume, whereas other youth becomes very, very quiet before the storm. The next page invites youth to identify what the strategies are that help them to calm down or regain control, whatever these might be. Whether they involve increased contact and support from other people, or time to themselves to chill out. Whether they involve relaxing their bodies or engaging in vigorous physical activity. Of course, some of these coping strategies won't be options for youth who are in secure settings. So some creativity may be needed to identify alternatives that are feasible or proxies for these strategies. For example, contacting a friend may not be possible for a youth with restricted access to a phone, but rereading an email from that friend or even simply picturing her face might be. The last page of this tool has two important components. First, it acts as a form of a, a contract or agreement between the youth and the staff. Not only that youth will do their best to keep themselves and others safe by using the self-calming strategies they've identified, but also staff will make a commitment to assist the youth with doing that. With a copy of this document in the youth file, for example, staff who are working with the youth for the first time can be made aware that, for example, this is a youth who responds very negatively to being touched, and we can be mindful of this. Or this is the youth who is given five minutes in a quiet space, is able to collect himself and calm down even after an explosion of temper. Second, there is a section for indicating that the document has been revised in the light of new information. In this way, it works best as a living, breathing document. For one thing, youth don't necessarily come into a facility or program with insight into what the situations are that trigger them. And it may be that as they work together, youth and staff will begin to be able to identify the patterns. For example, episodes of irritability, frustration, and unprovoked anger seem to always come as bedtime approaches. Could that be a trigger? By the same token, many youth and justice settings won't have a repertoire of coping strategies and will need staff to help them find some. Or they may not consciously identify things that they like doing, such as putting on their headset and listening to their favorite music, as things that they can do intentionally and mindfully as coping strategies. So over time, as staff get to know youth and youth get to better know themselves, the tool can be updated. And here is the form we created for adolescents which might be better received by those who would find the pictorial version to be uh, too useful for them. And again, just as with the youth, I'm happy to make these tools available uh, for those who might find them useful. Finally, just uh, for uh, Although the topic of diagnostic assessment is beyond our scope for today, I wanted to briefly provide information regarding the tools that are available um, for the clinical assessment of PTSD for those in the audience who might have the uh, proper training and degrees that would allow them to conduct diagnosis under the licensing laws um, that govern your jurisdiction. This is a time of a sort of awkward adolescence in the field for those wanting to conduct diagnostic interviews with children. The DSM-5 criteria were released so recently that test developers are for the most part still working on creating or validating DSM-5 updated versions of their instruments. Um, here you can see those that have been updated and the information about how to obtain them. Um, one of those is the child and adolescent version of the clinician-administered PTSD scale, or the CAPS, uh, which is the most widely regarded as the gold standard of PTSD um, diagnoses. 
uh, other well-validated interviews that have PTSD modules that have been updated for the DSM-5 are listed uh, here, including the SCID, the Kitty SADS, uh, and the MINI. And as per the most recent information I've been able to obtain, these other well-regarded diagnostic instruments are still in the process of being updated for DSM-5, um, but should be uh, released soon. Finally, I wanted to make everyone aware that at the National Child Traumatic Stress Network website, there's a wealth of information related to trauma and juvenile justice. And on this slide, I've provided uh, some of the resources that you'll find there, including a fact sheet on screening and assessment, the Think Trauma Training for Justice staff, um, access to some special issues on trauma and juvenile justice, and many other resources, including um, comprehensive reviews of many different measures of trauma exposure um, and PTSD symptoms. And on these next two slides, I provided references to some of the key articles that um, I referred to uh, today regarding our understanding of the links between trauma and juvenile uh, justice involvement. And last but not least, uh, thank you uh, from me and the Lorax, and I'd be happy to respond to um, any questions or comments. Great. Well, thank you so much, Patricia. This was uh, clearly a wealth of information here today. There was a, a number of tools that you talked about, uh, link after link of where we can access them all. So I just want to remind everybody that copies of today's PowerPoint will be emailed out to you uh, within about 24 to 48 hours of today's webinar end. So if you're looking for those links or you couldn't get them written down fast enough, don't worry. We'll make sure you get everything you need. And remember that you can type in your questions at any point here. Uh, for the remaining few minutes that we have, type in those questions on the webinar control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, you can type them in there. It should be a section called Questions, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, so earlier on in the presentation, I got a question uh, about something that we wanted to see if we could do a little bit more elaboration on between a static and dynamic PTSD symptoms. Do you think you could help explain the difference between those two a little bit? Oh, thank you. Uh, what a good question. Um, I wasn't referring to um, static or dynamic PTSD symptoms, but to the concept in uh, risk assessment that there are some risk factors that are considered static in that they simply are what they are and they are, um, are not things that could be a changed or be um, amenable um, to intervention. So static risk factors um, uh, are things such as the a youth's past history, their uh, socioeconomic status, um, things that can't be changed uh, through intervention. In contrast, in the in models of, of risk assessment more generally, um, what people are encouraged to focus on are dynamic risk factors. Those are things that may be true in the present that increase the likelihood of negative outcomes for youth in the justice system, but they can be changed. They're not just past history, they're active in the present, and so they are responsive to interventions in the present. So I was using that risk assessment framework to make a contrast between trauma exposure, which is past history and we can't change it, and post-traumatic stress reactions, which are occurring in the here and now, and for which we have some very effective interventions that have been developed and have been shown to be effective specifically in justice-involved populations. So um, the point that I was trying to make is that focusing on how post-traumatic reactions are affecting the use behavior in the present um, is a much more powerful um, source of information uh, that allows us to implement uh, trauma-informed interventions. Thank you. Great explanation there on the differences. 
Um, I've got a question that came all the way from Alaska, and um, it, the question is that so when we screen for addressing trauma, it's important to also look at resiliency. And do you know of any screening tools that get into resiliency at all? Oh, definitely, yes. There are some uh, pretty terrific um, resilience uh, measures that have been created um, recently. I'm probably not going to be able to pull the names out correctly um, off the top of my head, but if um, anyone wants to email me, um, I do have that information and would be um, happy to share it. There's also one that is um, under development um, currently that is uh, being pilot tested by uh, Sherry Hamby um, and uh, John Gritch that I think holds a lot of promise, um, in particular because it looks at resilience in a multi-dimensional framework, including not just competencies and strengths that the uh, child or the adolescent uh, carries uh, within themselves, but also sources of resilience in family relationships um, and contexts. So I'd be glad to follow up with anyone and, and provide them with uh, citations um, regarding uh, those measures. Great. So, and your email address is right on the screen here, so we can read. Yeah. Um, I've got a question from Peter, who wants to know a little bit about when we do screenings here. Uh, what has your experience been regarding the positive and/or negative effects of having youth um, do these screenings if they haven't yet established a trusting or a therapeutic relationship with the staff that are doing them? So they're right in the door to the facility, and we were giving them these screenings. Uh, he mentioned the old adage was, be prepared to deal with whatever you uncover. So how do you think this applies to uh, the trauma assessment during the intake process? That's a very good question. I, and I think it depends on a number of factors. The Part of it is the way in which the screening is presented um, to the youth. Um, I have uh, worked in um, settings where the Navy was the principal screening tool that was used, and youth were um, at uh, the uh, very um, entry into the facility, sat down in front of the computer, told rather gruffly that they needed to do this, and um, no explanation was uh, given and, and no attempt to um, create a context for it. We don't have ways of um, detecting whether um, youth are not responding um, candidly to something like the Maisie, although one of my students um, has a project uh, in play that may give us some insights into that um, by comparing the responses of youth um, who have been administered the Maisie over uh, multiple time points. But there, there is a different way of explaining to youth the purpose of a screening that I don't think requires necessarily the establishment of a relationship and a significant level of rapport, but communicates to the youth that staff are wanting to know about their experiences and thoughts and feelings as a way of understanding them and making sure that the youth and those around them um, are safe. And I think youth pick up very clearly on whether um, they are being asked to do something um, because the adults around them want to use that information um, to provide uh, caring um, uh, services to them versus whether this is just a routine gathering of um, information that doesn't necessarily um, uh, isn't necessarily going to be of um, direct benefit um, to the the youth. The one uh, place that I thought the question might be going that it didn't, but I, I think would be interesting to talk about anyway, is often um, I hear from staff a concern that doing this kind of screening um, could be um, distressing um, for youth. 
And um, I even, uh, at one of the trainings, um, had a gentleman tell me, you've convinced me that it's important to gather this kind of information, but I'll tell you, I don't want to be the person to do it. Because if a youth uh, disclosed to me that they had had any of these kinds of experiences, I wouldn't know what to say. Um, and I think one of the things that, that's very important um, to know is that we have a lot of really well-designed research that shows us clearly that youth who um, choose to disclose about traumatic experiences because they are interacting with somebody who they feel um, is a caring and calm person, do not find that experience to be upsetting or distressing. As a matter of fact, they tend to describe their feeling state after talking with somebody um, who, who is calm and caring as um, uh, feeling better um, than they did before they made that disclosure. So I think there's a lot to be said for staff training in how to introduce trauma screening um, in order to provide youth with a sense of psychological safety and to uh, encourage um, honest and valid responding, as well as staff training regarding how to respond um, to youth who do make disclosures, um, including uh, reassurance that um, this is not uh, necessarily or even likely um, to trigger re-experiencing among youth who've been traumatized. And that's a very comprehensive answer, so I appreciate that. Um, you know, so I've got a couple questions. We, we were getting a lot of questions from staff in the secure facilities or from the state agencies, but I've got a couple of questions here from uh, some other folks outside of the facility level that are looking to uh, maybe see where they can use some of this information on their own. So in uh, parole, juvenile parole officers, uh, defense attorneys, advocates, uh, do you have any uh, ways or suggestions on how those people could use uh, the information from screenings if they were to do these kinds of screenings to advocate for alternate placements or um, uh, other ways of keeping them out of incarceration? What are some things for that other audience there that you might be able to suggest for us? Definitely. I think that's one of the uh, beauties of screening, that it could be implemented in so many different contexts and at different um, points and, and phases in youth's journey through um, the juvenile justice system. We have had um, uh, probation uh, and parole officers use the triggers and coping strategies uh, with youth to um, help youth problem solve around um, the uh, kinds of situations where they're running into trouble and they're in danger of uh, recidivating or bombing out of programs or placements. Um, that it's not um, the, the kind of tool that requires clinical training, and it's not a psychotherapy, um, it is helping youth to uh, know themselves and identify um, what kinds of situations they need to uh, be um, aware of as triggers for them and to have in their hip pocket, ready when they need them, some ideas about um, self-calming strategies. Um, so I think it can definitely be used uh, with um, folks who are working with youth in the uh, community. Um, and um, sometimes I think juvenile defenders are in one of the, the best places to engage youth in this kind of a process. Um, because youth tend to trust their defenders uh, and to believe that they are there with the youth's best interests um, at heart. Um, so this is something that um, I've also shared um, with juvenile defenders and they have found this uh, useful in their work with those kinds of, of youth who are at very high risk 
um, for having uh, behavior problems, emotional explosions. Um, those are just the kind of youth um, who um, benefit from this kind of uh, trauma screening. Great. Well, thank you again. Uh, that's, that's actually bringing us right to our time here. It's 3.30 Eastern Time. Uh, so, I, Patricia, I really want to thank you for giving today's presentation. There was a lot of information, as I, I keep mentioning here, but uh, I want to remind everybody that you can get a copy of today's PowerPoint emailed to you in a, a follow-up email that we'll do within 24 to 48 hours. We'll also make sure we include a link to the video recording. So if you want to go back and watch the presentation, or if you've got somebody that you might want to share this information with, you can do so. Uh, you can find out about future and upcoming webinars by going to the CJCA website, cjca.net. Also follow our blog, and uh, you can find us on various social media sites. Uh, so on behalf of Jennifer Jarowski, our moderator today, Patricia Keurig, our presenter, and myself, I'm Brendan Donahue with CJCA. Thank you all for your time this afternoon, and I hope you have a great day. Thank you.